So we're really lucky to get one of the main speakers from the Theosophical Society. And he's going to speak of Seguin and the Green Knight. So welcome, Wayne. Thank you, uh, Neil. Well, it's nice to be here. I, I usually speak on theosophical topics and, you know, uh, Taoism, Buddhism, etc. This is a bit of a departure for me, but it's, it's an interesting challenge. <laughs> so, I'll just get this. The Green Knight in this tale has been connected to the idea of the Green Man. The name Green Man was first used by Lady Raglan, believe it or not, in March 1939 in an article she wrote for the Folklore Journal. Before this, they had been known as Foliat Heads, and no one had paid them any particular attention. I think Green Man's a lot, a lot trips off the tongue a lot better than Foliat Head. Sounds a bit weird. <laughs> green Men are usually found on religious buildings. But not always. The Green Man is also a popular name for English inn, inns and pubs. I think that one's in Liverpool. There's even a Green Man music and arts festival held in the Brecon Beacons in Wales in August. I think there's lots of other uh, festivals held around the country too. However, the Green Man is an example of how images from the old religion were brought into Christian churches before the Reformation and is one of the most ancient pagan symbols to be found in the Christian church. That's one that was seen earlier from Rosslyn Chapel near Edinburgh. I always think that reminds me of the, of the Incredible Hulk. He was a green man, wasn't he? Don't make me angry. You won't like me when I'm angry. <laughs> he looks quite angry. Pre-Christian pagan traditions and superstitions, particularly those related to nature and tree worship, were still influential in the Middle Ages. It is therefore perhaps not surprising that the green man seems to appear most often in places where there are stretches of ancient woodland, for example in Devon and Somerset, and on the edges of the forest areas of Yorkshire and the Midlands, but also, of course, all over the country in unexpected places sometimes. Lady Raglan suggested that in antiquity the Green Man was the central figure in the May Day celebrations throughout Northern and Central Europe. As the Green Man is also portrayed with acorns and hawthorn symbol leaves, this is what she says, I think it, uh, spot the obvious mistake here, symbols of fertility in medieval times, this would re seem to reinforce the association with spring. I can't see how acorns can be associated with spring. <laughs> Related figures such as Jack in the Green and Green George uh, appear much later in our folklore. The earliest records of a Jack in the Green appears in the Morning Chronicle and London Advertiser in 1775. However, the common theme which runs through these figures would seem to be that of death and rebirth and the green man that means life, though we've got a green man and a green woman. That's nice uh, equality, isn't it? I like that. Perhaps then the green man appears in our, on, on our medieval churches as a symbol of rebirth and resurrection, tying together the old ancient pagan symbols associated with spring and the Christian faith. The green man is one of the oldest symbols known to humankind. Most agree that he is Celtic in origin, but his image has been found across the ancient world. The foliage covered Lord of the Forest, nature and agriculture, was worshipped by many ancient, ancient tribes as one of the main gods. As awareness grew, the green man became an ever present symbol of birth, rebirth, rejuvenation, and the cycle of life and death. He preserved the forests, which also preserved the habitats of all creatures, and he protected vital streams and rivers and cleansed the air. 
He held space with all the magical creatures of the forest known as the Fae. And some have even called him the King of the Furries. The Christian mystic Hildegard of Bingen used the word viditas or greening. She believed in the healing power of green, the divine power of green in nature. According to Derek Bryce in his book The Mystical Way and the Arthurian Quest, the green man is often described as the king of the world, sometimes as the eternal prophet. It is said that he celebrates his sacred rites underground and that when he does so, the whole of nature above stands still and, still and silent. And of course we know that the Greek uh, and in, uh, Egyptian initiations and other places throughout history took place underground where the candidate had to remain for a period of time as part of the process. He also says that the Green Knight stands in as an initiator when a tradition is on the decline and no one else is qualified to do the initiation. You don't look very happy there. <laughs> Maybe that's a Christianized version where he doesn't like the old pagan symbology at the back. In the early Welsh text, Gawain is portrayed as a courageous but courteous and compassionate warrior, loyal to his uncle Arthur and his family. He is known as a friend to young knights, a defender of the poor and the unfortunate, and as the maiden's knight, he is a rescuer of damsels, damsels in distress. But of course nowadays it's, it's the way around, the damsels are rescuing the knights. <laughs> He is also said to possess healing skills and special swords that may include Excalibur, and his war horse was named Ringolet. In the later versions of his legend, he possesses superhuman strength connected to a day and night cycle, making him an invincible swordsman around noon when the sun is at its height. John Matthew's book, Sir Gawain, Knight of the Goddess, attempts to restore his rightful place amongst the knights of the round table and show that he was the original, one of the original Grail Knights. Although some legends say that he was mortally wounded in a duel with Lancelot, others say that he and Arthur were taken to the Isle of Avalon and were healed by Morgan Le Fay. And were still alive centuries later. In later Christianized versions, he was regarded as somewhat of a villain, as they wanted to replace him with good Christian knights, like Lancelot, and, Gwyn and, uh, and, and play down the pagan elements. And the stories are, completely, are extremely complex, with heroes becoming villains and vice versa. So one story appears in a, as a poem around the 14th century AD. So the story goes, goes that during a New Year's Eve feast at King Arthur's court, a strange figure, referred to only as the Green Knight, pays the court an unexpected visit. He challenges Arthur or any other person to a game. The Green Knight says that he will allow whoever, whoever accepts the challenge to strike him with his own axe on the condition that the challenger seeks him in exactly one year later to receive a blow in return. So this is an early chapter in the round table as the knights are referred to as beardless youths. Arthur was about to respond, but when the green knight mocks Arthur's silence, the king steps forward to take the challenge. As soon as Arthur grips the Green Knight's axe, Sir Gawain leaps up and asks to take the challenge himself. The Green Knight accepts the challenge. Gawain takes hold of the axe and in one deadly blow cuts off the Green Knight's head. To the amazement of the court, the now headless Green Knight picks up his severed head and before riding away, the head repeats the terms of the pact reminding the young Gawain to seek him in a year and a day at the Green Chapel. After the Green Knight leaves, the company goes back to its feast, as you do. We've just seen some of his head cut off. <laughs> Ta 
time passes and autumn arrives. On the day of All Saints, Gawain prepares to leave Camelot and find the Green Knight. He puts on his best armour, mounts his horse Gringolet, and starts off towards North Wales, travelling through the wilderness of northwest Britain. Gawain encounters all sorts of beasts, suffers from hunger and cold, and grows more desperate as the days pass. On Christmas Day, he prays to find a place to hear Mass. He's very Christianized, isn't he? <laughs> then looks up to see a castle shimmering in the distance. The Lord of the castle welcomes Gawain warmly. That's what we call a warm welcome. <laughs> Introducing him to, to, to his lady and to the old woman who sits beside her. I'll wait till later to find out who the old lady is. That's the, uh, or is it, the exciting bit. <laughs> For sport, the horse Bertilac strikes a deal with Gawain. The horse will go out hunting with his men every day. And when he returns in the evening, he will exchange his winnings for anything Gawain has managed to acquire by staying behind at the castle. Gawain happily agrees to the pact and goes to bed. The first day the Lord hunts a herd of deer while Gawain sleeps late in his bedchambers. On the morning of the first day, the Lord's wife sneaks into Gawain's chamber and attempts to seduce him. Gawain puts her off. Oh, the fool. <laughs> but before she leaves, she steals one kiss from him. That evening, when the horse gives Gawain the venison he has captured, Gawain kisses him, since he has won one kiss from the lady. So the second day, the Lord hunts a wild boar. The lady again enters Gawain's chamber, and this time she kisses Gawain twice. That evening, Gawain gives the horse the two kisses in exchange for the, for the boar's head. To me, it looks like he's enjoying the kissing. <laughs> the third day, the Lord hunts a fox, which I think is rather terrible, and the lady kisses Gawain three times. She also asks him for a love token, such as a ring or a glove. Gawain refuses to give her anything and refuses to take anything from her until, until the lady mentions her girdle. So you, you have to mention a girdle before a, he tries to change his mind. Well, the, the, the green sink girdle she wears around her waist is no ordinary piece of cloth the lady claims, but possesses the magical ability to protect the person who wears it from death. Intrigued, Gawain accepts the cloth, but when it comes time to exchange his winnings with the host, Gawain gives the three kisses, but does not mention the lady's green girdle. The host gives Gawain the fox skin he won that day, and they all go to bed happy. But weighed down with the fact that Gawain must leave for the green chapel the following morning to find the green knight. New Year's Day arrives, and Gawain dons his armour, including the girdle, then sets off with Gringolet, his faithful horse, to seek the Green Knight. A guide accompanies him out of the estate grounds, but when they reach the border of the forest, the guide promises not to tell anyone if Gawain decides to give up the quest. Gawain refuses, determined to meet his fate head on. Eventually he comes to a kind of crevice in a rock, visible through the tall grasses. He hears the whirring of a grindstone, confirming his suspicion that this strange cavern is in fact the Green Chapel. Gawain calls out and the Green Knight emerges to greet him. Intent on fulfilling the terms of the contract, Gawain presents his neck to the Green Knight who proceeds to feign two blows. On the third feint, the Green Knight nicks Gawain's neck, thoroughly drawing blood. 
So the Green Knight reveals his name as Bertie-like and explains that he, he was the lord of the castle where Gawain recently stayed. Because Gawain did not honestly exchange all, all of his winnings on the third day, Bertilak drew blood on his third blow. Nevertheless, Gawain has proven himself a worthy knight without equal in all the land. When Gawain questions Bertilak further, Bertilak explains that the old woman in the castle is really Morgan le Fay, and King, uh, Gawain's aunt and King Arthur's half-sister. She sent the Green Knight on his original errand and used her magic and used her, um, uh, and used her magic to change Bertilak's appearance. Relieved to be alive but extremely guilty about his sinful failure to tell the truth, Gawain wears the girdle on his arm as a reminder of his own failure. So she must have a very short, slim waist if he can wear it on his arm, wasn't she? Right, uh, <laughs> I wonder if that's where we get the order of the garter from. He returns to Arthur's court where all the knights join Gawain wearing girdles on their arms to show their support. So we can see from all this that Gawain goes through a number of trials before he meets the Green Knight at the Green Chapel. As said, green is the symbol of rebirth and the spring of awakening on all levels, even in a spiritual sense to our true nature. The Green Knight knows that by cutting off his head, he will not really die, perhaps being deprived only of merely the head knowledge. And that will not be of great importance in the final analysis. In the Voice of the Silence, which is written by H.P. Blavatsky, who was the foundress of the Theosophical Society, she talks about the difference between head learning, which is merely intellectual, and the wisdom of the heart, which is intuitive understanding. We have to develop the intuitive understanding to really uh, uh, know what spirituality is about. So it's interesting also that Gawain has a pentagram inscribed on his shield, each point representing a virtue he has to remember through his, through his journey to keep him focused. Amongst other things, they represent five virtues a knight should have. Loving kindness, which we all need, Compassion, again very important. Courtesy, integrity and openness. Very wonderful that we could all live by those, those rules in this, in this world. And this was expressed in the brilliant film directed by David Rudkin. If anybody gets a, a chance to, to, get to watch that film, it was a, a Channel 4 production in the 90s, but you can get it on DVD. It's very faithful to the original story. And the original story is a mixture of Christian and pagan elements, but it's a really, really interesting film. And the pentacle is also used in magical operations and for protection. And I went to Wikipedia for this next bit. You know, how wonderful is Wikipedia? Um, so the pentacle is used in magical operations and for protection. Wikipedia tells us there's a fourth book of occult philosophy made it, written in 1565, which was falsely attributed to Agrippa. And this gives detailed instructions as how pentacles should be formulated. It says, but now we come to speak of the holy and sacred pentacles and sigils. Now these pentacles are, as it were, certain holy signs, preserving us from evil chances and events, and helping and assisting us to bind, exterminate, and drive away evil spirits, and alluring the good spirits, and reconciling them to us. And these pentacles do consist either of characters of the good spirits of the superior order, or of sacred pictures of holy letters or revelations with apt and fit versicles, which are composed either of geometrical figures and holy names of God, according to the course and manner of many of them, or they are compounded of all of them, or very many of them mixed. That's all straightforward, isn't it? 
So these ideas are incorporated in the story as a symbol is meant to protect Gawain on his journey. In the Golden Dawn magical system, the Earth Pentacle is one of four elemental weapons or tools of an adept. These weapons are symbolical representations of the forces employed for the manifestation of the inner self, the elements required for the incarnation of the divine. In the tarot, the minor arcana are divided into four suits, much like conventional playing cards, which are swords, batons, cups, and coins. Following the innovation of Eliphas Levi, many English language writers on tarot divination now call the coins pentacles and the batons wands. The first published tarot deck to use an actual suit of pentacles was the 1909 Rider Waite Smith tarot deck. That deck inspired the creation of subsequent tarot decks which likewise have a suit of pentacles. In the Rider Waite Smith tarot deck, Edward, Arthur Edward Waite designed the pentacles as golden discs with a pentagram on them. The Wiccan style of pentacle, which is a disc that is covered by a pentagram symbol, was based upon these pentacles from the Rider Waite Smith tarot deck. And this traditional suit of coins revises pentacles in the 1909 Rider Waite tarot, tarot deck were designed by Golden Dawn initiates A.E. Waite and Pamela Coleman Smith. So now we can see that the pentacle has much deeper meanings than the one ascribed to it by Christianity. So in the tale, the pentacle on the shield helps to remind Gawain of his knightly duties. It is also interesting to know that the old lady in the story turns out to be Morgan Le Fay, not looking much like an old lady there. Originally, she was not evil, as many people, uh, as most tales and films portray her, but actually a protector of King Arthur and one of those who took him to the Isle of Avalon when he was dying, as said. She was a healer and enchantress. Her character is very ambiguous because she may be the combination of a number of characters, some good and some evil. Uh, traditionally, she is the half-sister of Arthur and the mother of Mordred, who is also Arthur's son after she tricked him. He was said to be the one who brought about Arthur's downfall, which led to his death. The characters of Morgan Le Fay and Mordred are extremely complex and would take several lectures to explain their full depth. But it's beyond the scope of this talk, of course. In the context of this story, though, even though our, her identity is only revealed at the end, as she has been posing as an old woman, it is said that she had been orchestrating the whole event. She sent the Green Knight to Arthur's court to terrify Guinevere, hopefully to death, <laughs> who she was jealous of. Uh, and it was she that was behind all the events that occurred. So though she's only mentioned very briefly, she plays a very big part in the whole drama. So when Bertilac goes out hunting, it is Morgana who arranges for his wife to try to seduce Gawain. But Gawain remains true to his chivalrous duty, but not, so as not to offend the woman, he agrees to a kiss, but no more. And he openly tells Bertilac and gives him the kiss in return. So three times he is honest, as said, but on the third time he keeps the sash secret as he believes it will save his life. So this is the only time he shows a lack of faith in his nightly duties. So it has been suggested that there is a link between Bertilac's hunting and the pursuit of Gawain by Bertilac's wife. Bertilac gives Gawain the fruits of his day's hunting as Gawain gives Bertilac what he has gotten from the day's events. As mentioned earlier, Gawain has his roots in pagan tradition, which the Christians tried unsuccessfully to crush out, as they try to crush out anything that's not Christian, uh, their own teachings which have been altered many times, as even Jesus suddenly ceases to be Jewish in their eyes 
we see pictures of Jesus with a, 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 a you know, European face and lovely blo long blonde tresses and a nice beard. You know, but that's not probably how he looked. So fortunately, the pagan traditions have not been crushed out, but remained and are now coming to the fore again. So Gawain goes through lots of trials and tests and mainly succeeds in his initiation at trials. In the end, it is the green knight, symbolized by nature, that gives him his final test. So nature is our greatest teacher if we only resist the temptations of this material world. A theosophical master says that sermons may even be preached through stones. I always find that a really interesting statement. Sermons can even be preached through stones. We can learn anything from, from nature. So it is in, our, in nature, away from any material distractions, that he faces his destiny. Remember that the guide who led him to the Green Chapel tried to tempt him to give up his quest and that he would tell no one if he did. It's like all the things that prevent us from continuing on our pilgrimages, that try to make us doubt and make us feel that we should turn back and live a so-called normal life. We've been through so much and experienced so much that it has given us a different view of the world and our relationship with it. It requires a leap to leave behind the pull of the past. Um, Plato says that heaven sent madness is preferable to man-made sanity. That's a very profound saying you know, because we have to act in certain ways to be regarded as being sane and if we act in, in ways that are guided by our divine nature, our inner self, we regard as being insane. That, you know, and we, so we have, to com we have to comply to be accepted as being normal. So in one sense, the characters in the story are aspects of ourselves. There is the questing mind, like Gawain, that has to go through many trials and tribulations to awaken to what we truly are like the coming of spring and all its greenery. It's as Hildegard of Bingen says, the divine power of green in nature. Not just the physical nature or the physical green, but the inner meaning of both. It has the power to bless and heal on all levels. The lower nature in the form of Morgana Le Fay in many ways tries to throw us off the trail and beguile us. But if we stand firm in our true being, then we are sure to come through in the end. And nature will remain as our guide and inspiration, as there is no greater book than the book of nature. And if we learn to read that, we will discover many secrets that are hidden from the lower aspects of our mind that is predominant in modern society. It's now becoming evident that the connection with nature is essential as we are more and more becoming divorced from it. Grounding is a wonderful way of benefiting from the healing effects of nature. Walking barefoot on the grass. If you can, walk completely naked. Uh, if you can avoid being arrested. But, you know, it's, it's, it's just wonderful. And there, in, in Japan, there's something known as Shinrin-yoku, which is forest bathing. Just going into the forest and feeling that oneness with trees and all living things. Forest bathing. One of my favourite things to think of, forest bathing. Go hug a tree, just wander in the forest, feel oneness with nature, with, no sh with your shoes off, or your, all your clothes off, whatever you wish. In another talk I, I gave, which is called Grow as the Flower Grows, I said, so in one sense we are all flower children, opening up to the light and realising what flower power really is. I always liked flower power in the 60s. It became rather de degenerate, but it was... It's a beautiful idea. I remember that image of the, uh, in Vietnam of the hippies holding this flower up to the soldiers, uh, the American soldiers like this, you know. The power of a flower. Thich Nhat Hanh, who was a Zen, um, a Zen monk, said that um, we should think of each other as flowers. And again, water each other with love. And that's how we grow and, and expand in, in spiritually. 
So I know that when I go out into nature, I just fit in with everything around me, the fluttering butterfly, the flowers, the trees, the birds, everything. I just slot in like the last piece of a jigsaw. It seems that there is nothing more to do. Everything is at last as it should be. There's a great lesson in this. They were just, are just as much a part of nature as a tree or a flower. And despite all our worlds, words and thoughts and meditations, the book of nature contains all that we need to know if we only know how to find it. So in the book of nature, uh, there's everything we need to know. So Gawain faces his, his, his fate bravely, but survives because of his honesty, on receiving a slight nick, as said before. He faces the possibility of death as part of the initiation process and comes through a renewed man. In Tibet, monks will sit on, and meditate on burial grounds, help them overcome their fear of death. But I'd like to look at how the teachings can be practically applied as this is by far the most important. So we must try to be honest with ourselves and others, follow the heart, the intuition, no matter what the world throws at us. We know inwardly what is right, and we know that only a small percentage of humanity do and are able to think for themselves. So we must carry on despite the voices that try to dissuade us. It is the hero in us, the spiritual warrior. So there's a quote for, um, this is a quote from a book called The Light on the Path by Mabel Collins. It says, stand aside in the coming battle, and though thou fightest, be not thou the warrior. Look for the warrior and let him fight in thee, or her fight in thee. Take his orders for battle and obey them. Obey them not as though he were a general, but as though he were thyself, and his spoken words were the utterance of thy secret desires. For he is thyself, yet infinitely wiser and stronger than thyself. Look for him, else in the fever and hurry of the fight thou mayest pass him, and he will not know thee unless thou knowest him. If thy cry meet his listening ear, then will he fight in thee, and fill the dull void, void within. And if this is so, then canst thou go through the fight cool and unwearied standing aside and letting him battle for thee. That it will be impossible for thee to strike one blow amiss. But if thou look not for him, if thou pass him by, then there is no safeguard for thee. Thy brain will reel, thy heart will grow uncertain, and in the dust of the battlefield, thy sight and senses will fail, and they will not know thy friends from thy enemies. He is thyself. Yet thou art but finite and liable to error. He is eternal and is sure. He is eternal truth. And once he has entered thee and become thy warrior, he will never utterly desert thee. And in the great peace, he will become one with thee. So remember what the pentacle represented on Gawain's shield. Loving kindness, compassion, courtesy, integrity and openness. And they become a lot clearer now. And these things haven't, haven't to be followed in a rigorous way. They've got to be followed, adapted to our lives. Um, for the, the world's so full of the opposite. It's so full of anger and resentment, isn't it? And people don't seem to love one another. People seem to hate one another. And uh, there's always arguments and there's conflicts all over the place. So what kind of planet is it that we don't, we don't, we don't realise uh, the dignity of human nature, the beauty of human nature, the wonder of, of, of the human being. We're beautiful beings, you know, we're wonderful beings. We're like flowers in the gardens of life. They're blossoming, opening, you know. Um, I remember an album by Donovan that said something like, a gift from a flower to a garden or something like that. You know, we, we should just try to love one another, just try to be, be loving, kind, kind to each other. 
No wonder these aliens don't seem to want to land because <laughs> when they see what we're doing, falling out, fighting amongst ourselves, we're all the same. You know, the, uh, the, um, the motto of the, the ob objects of the Theosophical Society is a universal brotherhood, sisterhood of humanity, regardless of race, creed, sex, caste, or colour. Or color. And, it's, and the, the motto is there is no religion higher than truth. You know, truth is something very important. So, you know, uh, and I feel very strongly about this because I, I see so, so often that people are, you know, it just baffles me why people are so cruel to each other. You know, I, I, I can't kind of somehow understand it. It's just a, a puzzle to me. You know, we just, maybe we're afraid of each other. I think people are afraid, afraid somehow of each other. We're afraid of one another, different colours, different sexual orientations, different religions. We're all, you know, terrified. So anyway, that's more or less it. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed this and thank you for listening. Well, that was amazing. Thanks. I mean, they, very profound wisdom, very easy to do, but nobody ever does it. <laughs> it's like <laughs> one of those strange things, isn't it? Yeah. And now there must be questions. Very difficult for you guys to ask questions these days. Usually there's millions of people with hands going up. What was that one? <laughs> Thank you. Fascinating talk. Um, Thank you. I suppose a question your thoughts on a lot of the ancient mystery cults among other organisations have some form of death and rebirth as an integral part yeah. of that journey and one of the things that came to my mind during that was the metaphorical death and rebirth of Gawain yeah. Yeah. as part of the drawing blood so just an expansion on your thoughts on that please. Could you... Uh... I didn't quite hear that properly. What, 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 do you, what was the question? I heard some of it, but I couldn't hear the. I thought, it, yeah. Yeah. Can you can you hear me now? Can you? Yeah. No. It's a bit quiet. Ancient, ancient oh right. Okay. Yeah. Like uh, initiation. We're talking about um, the mystery cults and the death and uh, rebirth, like initiation, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that, that, to me, that's you know, that was part of the initiation process. Like, it's like Jesus went into the uh, cave, didn't he, for three days and came out again. I think that was part of the initiation process was to, was to go underground and, and go through a symbolic death. And then after three days, he rose again. That's as far as I understand it. It's all part of the initiation process. Uh, you know, the, um, the mystical death, they call it. In, in the East, again, to the East, you know, the, the initiates used to go for a certain amount of time into a certain place, in a place called Shambhala, you heard of Shambhala, where they used to go into this uh, temple and they would, they would, the bodies would symbolic, really die, seem to die. But after a while, they would, they, would, they would come out and they would be re regenerated, renewed. And that's part of the initiation process, yeah. We, um, in the Atlantis book that myself and Thomas did, we look at the chambered tombs that are all around the world and suggest that maybe they were part of an early religion that was part of an initiation cult. No, yeah. not cult, but a way of being. Any more? Oh, oh, yeah. You mentioned the film, but you told us who. But we, you, it I was yeah, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Ah, right. But it was by, it was, uh, directed by David Rudkin. Okay, thank so you. So it's available on a DVD. You can get it from Amazon or whatever. Yeah, it's a really good film. It's a, it sticks closely to the story, and it's really it's the one where I got the those um, those five things from. Chris Symbol was the Pentacle. <laughs> 